Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're very happy that so many of you join us for this international panel. Um, it's about cross-cultural issues around disfigurement in children, in adults, in people. Huh? We will have um, two steps or two parts in our panel. The first part will be that we are we're discussing some issues just among the panel members. And in a second part, which is very important for us, we want to discuss these issues with you. So you can just give, give us any comments, ask questions, whatever. We just want to open up the discussion. Depending on how active you are, it takes a bit longer <laughs> or shorter. So we are quite flexible with regard to the time. Okay, so um, after these uh, introductory remarks, let me just uh, introduce uh, my guests. We have on my right side, on your left side, uh, this is Shankar Manrai. He is a professor of plastic surgery and he is the director and former head of the Clefton Burn Center in Nepal. So he's coming quite a long way. Just arrived yesterday. <laughs> Maybe he's still a bit jet lagged, so we have to help him <laughs> to stay awake. And then just beside him, that's uh, James Partridge. James uh, comes from the UK, and he is the founder of uh, Changing Faces, a large British charity you certainly have heard about. And on my right side, we have uh, Habib Ur Raham Kazim. Hopefully, I pronounced that correctly, and uh, Habib is the head of the Child Burn Center at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Care in Afghanistan. So another um, person who came uh, quite a long way uh, to Zurich. He has been here many times before, so <laughs> he's quite familiar with our country. James and, uh, and, and uh, Shankar are first time in Zurich, I suppose, yeah, okay. So my first question to the three of you would be, uh, can you each say a few words about uh, your current work with children with disfiguring conditions? Just what you're exactly doing in your daily work. Maybe you can begin. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much again for this uh, uh, great opportunity. Uh, I'm actually here to learn um, a lot of things, especially about uh, pediatric burn care. Um, but at the same time, it's a great opportunity to share um, um, from um, from Nepal side as well. Um, the uh, plastic surgery department um, that um, I work at uh, takes care of a lot of children uh, with uh, uh, congenital deformities involving like cleft, uh, moles, um, and then uh, trauma, especially burns. Um, the number of the patients who are coming to our center has been increasing every year because of the um, prominence of the center since um, uh, there are very few centers where um, a, a multidisciplinary burn care or trauma care is uh, provided. Um, so um, we are seeing more and more of them as we go. Okay, thank you. James? Um, again, thank you, Marcus, for inviting me. It's been a very interesting uh, day already here in Zurich. Um, I, ha I was the founder of a charity called Changing Faces, um, which I set up 25 years ago, actually 27 years ago. Um, and the intention of the charity was to support and represent people with disfigurements of all sorts. My own um, background is that I have a uh, disfigurement from a car fire that I got in 1970, yes, it's a very long time ago, um, when I was 18, and it was a very shattering experience for me. Um, and on that, uh, I will pass on, but suffice to say that I have worked in this field. I'm not a doctor. Um, I've worked with psychologists, sociologists, communications people, um, in the charity for 25 years, and we've seen a great many people contact us for help with all sorts of disfigurements. Thanks. I think it's on, yeah, just sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I'm working in Kabul, Afghanistan. I'm professionally a pediatric surgeon. 
and since six years, I'm a chief of a pediatric burn unit, the only burn unit in all over the country, for children in all over the country. And we are treating every year uh, about 1,000 patients in, in suffer of burn, and um, it's the only burn unit in all over the country. Great, thank you. So now let's go to our topic of this um, panel today. Um, it's about cross-cultural issues. So can you tell us about how uh, individuals with, with disfiguring conditions are treated in your society? Because you're coming from really different societies. And um, I don't know who wants to start telling about um, how people are treated in your society. Do you uh, want to start? Well, uh, Nepal um, is... Uh, uh, predominantly Hindu and uh, Buddhist uh, um, population, um, but uh, the two uh, cultures amalgamate very easily there. Um, it's very difficult to differentiate who is Hindu and who is uh, Buddhist, and there are many temples which are shared by both the cultures. Uh, they, both the Hindus and uh, Buddhist, um, offer the the pujas or, or uh, meditations uh, in many of these temples. Uh, um, in our culture, uh, people with uh, disabilities and deformities are not well treated. Um, it's primarily because of the belief that uh, um, whatever happens to you in this life is because of what you did in the past life. That's the belief uh, we have. Um, in other words, it's fatalism. Um, the fate decides everything. Uh, what you are going to be uh, and how you are going to look, uh, what's going to happen to you, everything is decided at the time of your birth, depending upon the position of the planets and things like that. Uh, so it's a very um, pessimistic kind of um, uh, belief, I would say. Um, uh, it's uh, it doesn't help the people with the disabilities and deformities, um, especially in in the in the part of your body which is visible, especially your face, for example. Um, so uh, the culturally, um, it's very disadvantageous uh, situation in Nepal. So that's kind of a punishment, like because they didn't behave well in the former life, right. they right. now have a disfiguring condition. Right. And at the same time, um, the, um, the parents, for example, if, uh, if, a, uh, if a deformed child is born to a family, uh, the family is kind of um, um, taken as they must have done something seriously bad in the in their former life or in the past, okay. so that they had a child with the mm -hmm. deformity. Mm -hmm. That's how it's believed. Mm -hmm. And can you give us a few examples on how these people are treated, for example? Uh, what? I have the experience, of, most experience of um, treating the children with cleft deformities. Um, um, many of them were uh, discarded by the family. They were deserted in the jungle or you know, okay. uh, places um, where other people pick them up and then later on they were brought to us for surgery. Um, many of the children were um, um, thrown away to the grandparents. Um, grandparents usually, you know, take care of these children, whereas uh, the parents uh, don't want to even see them. Um, I know a patient who's father committed suicide because he was told that a very deformed child was born because of the bilateral cleft. Um, so he, he committed suicide before he saw the child. And we have treated the child and then now he's an adult, he goes to college, um, he's educated now, um, he's going to be a professional soon, but he misses his father. Mm -hmm. um, there are many other mm -hmm. in instances mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically they are not treated very well. Mm -hmm. Sounds difficult, yeah. Yes. 
Okay, so James, would you say something about the UK, which might not be very different to other Western countries, maybe? Well, I would say that Britain is a fairly typical Western society. This is working. Yes. yes. It's, Britain is a fairly typical Western society in that it's increasingly uh, a look-perfect society. Um, we are bombarded with a visual diet of airbrushed adverts and cosmetic surgery adverts and messages about the importance of, quote, looking good um, and looking perfect, actually. Uh, it's a secular society, largely a very increasingly secular. Um, and although it's supposed to be a society that is supporting and um, very egalitarian in its uh, philosophy and politics, I'm afraid to say there are some very nasty racist and other tendencies coming more and more into our society, uh, very loud and, and a rather... Um, separated, div divergent society is emerging. And how does that affect somebody with a facial or other disfigurement? I think it makes it very much more difficult. I think the look perfect uh, messages are extremely difficult for many children and their parents mm -hmm. and, and adults to come to terms with. I think the... Um, we did a survey in 2008 uh, of adults' experiences. Eight, over 800 adults replied, a 45-minute survey, so it was very full. And three things really came out of that. One was that uh, people felt very much the face in the crowd. Uh, they felt that they were stared at and ridiculed and commented about in public places far far more than they should be, which would which would really um, suggest this loss of civil inattention mm -hmm. that the mm -hmm. uh, social anthropologists have noticed, the loss of civil inattention. Um, when most people walk down the road, you are not observed. People are um, inattentive to you. You're anonymous. There's somebody with a disfigurement or some kind of unusual feature goes down the road, they are observed. They can't avoid being observed and sometimes ridiculed and, and so on. The second thing is that people say that their choice of school, of career and of jobs has been heavily affected by their appearance. And often that means that they haven't been able to get into a particular mm -hmm. career because they've been barred or the job adverts are too difficult They've been to lots and lots of interviews and not got into that job. So that causes underemployment. A lot of people would say, I'm not doing the job that I, I could do because I can't get the job because of my appearance. And the third, which is the really most difficult one, I think, is there seems to be endemic low expectations. Um, people and their parents report, um, we don't really expect you know, a great mm -hmm. deal. Uh, and of course now with social media, uh, which social media has its drawbacks, but the great thing about social media is it's spreading messages about you can do this. And, and there is now a quite, in Britain, there's quite a body of particularly young women who are coming out and saying, look, I can do this. My face may look different, but I can do this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's so, uh, although I f sound rather pessimistic, actually there are some causes for optimism, mm, I think. Mm, mm. So you would say there are some changes, some developments? These changes are changes against a tide. Mm -hmm, They're mm -hmm, pushing mm -hmm. against a tide that is very, very powerful. Mm, mm -hmm. um, you can have cosmetic surgery. In fact, you ought to have cosmetic mm -hmm, surgery mm -hmm. to fix that, and it will fix it. Um, bad luck, you, you, know, you don't look too good and so on. And there are other forces that are negative too. And I'm, I'm afraid to say I need to mention Hollywood movies here. They don't give anybody with any facial scarring any help whatsoever. So there's a lot that has to change. But mm -hmm. I can be a little optimistic mm -hmm. too. Okay.
thank you. Um, Habib, what about your Yes, society? unfortunately in Afghanistan there is always news about war and violence, which is not in our religion and not in our culture. This war is, has been imposed on us. <coughs> Despite all the trouble we have, with, fortunately uh, we have the less the small percentage of the people who will discriminate the disabled and disfigured people. Uh, there is common saying in our society that uh, disfigurement and disability is not the choice of the people who suffered, but it is the creation of Allah, the God. Um, we have some people that they will stare the people in the street, in the way. But around that, there will be some other people who will stop them. Even they will treat them by force, not to uh, teasing the disabled people. Uh, there are some s several reasons. It can be a religious, because the religion uh, advices are like this, not to uh, stare the people uh, with disability and disfigurement. Uh, there can be a cultural issues and there are the social issues that the people are living together, one family and there are some families who will, of course, they will support their children, their family members, not to discriminate them mm -hmm. or uh, tease them mm -hmm. in the way. So these are the issues. Has the, the war changed something with regard to this topic? Because I, I've never been to Afghanistan, but I've read about uh, Afghanistan. And I suppose you have a lot of uh, disfigured people there because of the war. And so I think like uh, disfigured people in Switzerland are not something you see every day. Is it different in Afghanistan? And has that changed uh, through the war? Yes, of course, we, we have a lot of dis disabled pa people in our country and approximately every family have one person with okay. disability. And because of this war and using of this uh, weapons since 40 years, we have the congenital dis uh, deformity, congenital anomalies, the patient. Yes, we have these problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between um, conditions that are acquired uh, versus uh, congenital conditions, how the people are treated? Uh, yes, uh, like Professor Shankar Rai said before, we have also the same uh, thinking. The people, they have the same thinking that if uh, there will be one child born with the, uh, congenital anomalies, deformities, the other people will think that this, the parents have made some mistakes and now the okay. baby arrived like this. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, yes, this problem we have. That there's a difference between congenital and acquired conditions? Yes, yeah. there okay. is. Okay. Okay. Do you also see that in, in Western countries, uh, James? Uh, I, think there are different I think there are differences, but they're not religious differences. I think um, the psychological adjustment of somebody who acquires uh, a condition at birth is different to somebody who has a burn at 12 years old or something like that. Um, the acquisition of self-identity and how well they adjust to their school uh, settings, you know, those are different. If you grow up from, from infancy with a condition, um, you learn techniques, you hope you learn how to be strong and confident, whereas if you get a, uh, if you're involved in a, some kind of Burns experience at, in early adolescence, that may be very, very problematic. Um, so I would say it wasn't so much cultural as um, to do with the, uh, the development of the child. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Another issue I'm uh, very interested in is um, with regard to gender differences. Um, um, in our Western countries, we often hear from females and girls that they experience much more stigmatizing behaviors than boys or males. Um, how is that in your country? So uh, do you also have uh, like a different um, reactions to boys versus girls and women versus men? I, th I think it's a very interesting question. Um, 
Um, we have uh, uh, much more, you know, cultural preferences uh, to the males. Obviously, it's a male-dominated society in Nepal. So, if 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 uh, there is a girl and boy with the same kind of deformity, the boys are treated better than the girls. Obviously, the girls will have hardly any chance of getting married, for example, or um, even going to school um, or to the public places. Um, the males are accepted a little better, I would say. And so there is a big difference between mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the, the female and the male child, obviously in general also, not just with the uh, deformities, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. in general life also, there is a big difference between the uh, the treatment of uh, two genders. So there's the inequality with regard to many issues and topics. Yes, and yes. that shows also with regard to yes to the yes. disfigurement. Yes. Okay, yes. okay. How about um, in your country in Afghanistan? As a whole, in Afghanistan, there is a big difference in between gender. It is a man dominant uh, country, but uh, for the deformity or disabilities, disfigurement, um, we. Afghan people, they give more attention to the girls for the treatment of the girls. And uh, for walking in the city or in the street, uh, fortunately they have hijab and niqab. So they are white, they can avoid their face, no one can see, so there is no problem for them uh, in the uh, So what you're saying society. is that wearing a veil, um, a hijab or a niqab, that's a kind of a protection against stigmatization. Yes, there is a kind of protection for the women, uh, but most of the women, the girls, the girls, uh, they are staying at home. They, if they have uh, this disfigurement, uh, no one will marry them, and they are at home. And if the family can afford, they can perform surgery. But uh, the most of population, they have low economic condition, and they cannot afford. And in our public hospital, we have no the facilities. Or, to perform the plastic surgeries and reconstructive surgeries. Very less, uh, I think we have just three hospitals in Kabul and one in Herat who are, where we can perform the surgery. But always, uh, even in this hospital, we are always busy in life-threatening surgeries. So for the plastic and reconstructive surgery or for aesthetic surgeries, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. no time. Mm -hmm. And there, is, uh, there are no a lot of doctors, also plastic surgeons in our country. So, so these are issues. Very important. So you are saying a lot of families are keeping their children at home, not sending them to school. And is that different between boys and girls? So are more, more girls kept at home, or is it the same with the boys? Uh, yes. Um, the, they will not come, of, uh, come out of home themselves. They are shy. They are, uh, don't want to, most of them, they don't want to come out, they don't want to show their faces to the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is not like here that uh, they will perform several surgeries and day by day their health will be better mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. will look a little mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. So uh, they don't, they avoid like this their self. And there are also, if I understand that correctly, there are also children who never get any medical treatment because the families cannot afford it and they're just being kept at home. Yes, uh, there are a lot of children, uh, even they are elder now, they have never come to the hospital for treatment and they are at home. And the families, they don't know that the treatment of these diseases mm -hmm. is possible, mm -hmm. especially for disfigurement, even uh, most of the people, uh, they are elder now and they will come to the hospital for the treatment of their congenital anomalies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. James, any thoughts about gender differences in Western countries? Uh, undoubtedly, if you were to analyze the, say, 10,000 people, no more than that, say 20,000 people who contacted Changing Faces over the last 20 years, something like 65% of them, maybe 70% are women. So we know that those who seek help are more women mm -hmm. than men. Uh, and then if you ask of the people who seek help, um, what is the, the primary reason? And I think the inequalities that women feel in the workplace 
uh, and in society in general are borne out in in the how they cope with disfigurement too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is made even more difficult because we live in such a, as I called it, a looks perfect world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think women feel that more intensely than men. Um, the other statistic that I would use is we've, over the years, we've noticed that of the people that contact us, something like 30% are pretty well adjusted. They, they have sorted out their experience and their way of coping quickly. About 40% are struggling but sort of coping day by day, and 30% aren't. And I would say that of that 30%, a predominant, the predominant um, agenda is women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, women are very liable to be at home, isolated, um, often very depressed, uh, friendless, and fear, fearful of even going down to the shop. So I would say definitely uh, it's, it appears that women have a more difficult yeah. adjustment and are probably stigmatized more mm -hmm. for, their, mm -hmm. for their disfigurement mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. men, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't to say that men find it very easy either. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think... Uh, that, that's where, yeah. where I would say in, in Britain. And that's very similar, obviously, across the, the cultures. Yeah. Huh? Okay. And, and actually, I, <laughs> I've had quite a lot of contact with other Western countries, Australia, um, the States, and in fact, um, recently, um, more in, in Southeast Asia, and similar sort of findings, I think, that women are feeling the pressures of the cosmetic world, uh, women with disfigurements are feeling the pressures increasingly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so another issue we already um, talked about a bit is uh, religion. Um, you mentioned um, religion with saying uh, your country is Hindu and Buddhism, and um, you also mentioned shortly the, the religion. So. I'm wondering what's the influence of the religion on how a society treats um, disfigured people. Um, you, we have very different religions here. <laughs> you are, um, you told me you are half a Buddhist and a, Hin and, and a Hindu. Um, you are a Muslim and you are a Christian or I don't know what um, secular person. I don't know mm. how we could call that, but it's very different from your background. And, and it might be interesting to hear your thoughts about um, how the religion influences um, how society treats um, disfigured people. Uh, will, you, will you want to start, uh, Shankar, saying about Buddhism and Hinduism? Uh, well, the Buddhism would uh, um, take this problem as uh, something that um, um, is more like, um, um, you know, um, Buddhism, Buddhist kind of, you know, uh, philosophy would uh, be much more softer than the Hinduism, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, as... Uh, um, I mean, any problems that are there in your life, um, you um, deal with that slowly, and then you do not react too much to anything. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. philosophy of Buddhism. Whereas in the Hinduism, um, it could be more kind of pessimistic. Um, you are what you are because of your fate mm -hmm. in the Hinduism. Um, I think it has to do a lot uh, with the uh, thinking of the people and how they react to any deformity, um, either in yourself, oneself, or um, with other people. Mm -hmm. um, the person who has uh, deformity, they usually uh, see it as like... Um, something that they cannot do anything about. Um, they are left to be um, um, disadvantaged in, in any step that they take. Um, 
Buddhism takes it more positively, I would say. Um, but majority of our people in Nepal are Hindus. Um, even though there is not much distinct um, differences between the two cultures, you know, they, they, they go together. Uh, um, so I think the culture definitely has a big influence in how the people with the, def the deformities as well as uh, people without deformities looking at uh, the people with deformities um, affect. Um, how about the Islam? I know you, we, we have uh, talked about that yesterday when we were preparing um, our panel and you said it's quite a sensitive issue. I just want to explain why you probably will read some of these sentences. So um, Habib was a bit concerned because he isn't a scholar <laughs> and, and in Islam it's, it's very important that um, because also this is recorded and everything, that you don't want to say something wrong. So what you did is you checked with the mullah, I think, yes. and now you have a, a kind of a statement which is um, um, supported by, by a mullah and which is something like an official um, um, statement um, authorized by, by your mullah. And that's the reason I think you want to read it and not just want to talk freely and tell us what he thinks. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So you have explained yeah, the yeah. reason. Uh, so... I'm not a scholar of a religious scholar, so I have to read it from the paper. That uh, what is the Islamic perspective on the concept of disability? Islamic philosophy has a positive attitude toward needy individual and those who are in a disadvantaged situation. The Quran and the Hadith not only declare the existence of disabilities as a natural part of a human nature, but also provided principle and practical suggestion for caring of, for disabled people, as well as discussing the significance of such caring. Islam gives a great deal of attention to all groups within society. Each has their own rights, including individuals with a disability. In order to understand disability in Islam, an Islamic context, based on some example of physical condition, such as blindness, deafness, lameness, mental retardation, and leprosy. An example of such in the Quran, there is, an, there is not upon the blind any guilt, or upon the lame any guilt, or upon the ill any guilt. And how, whoever obey Allah and his messenger, he will admit him to a garden beneath which rivers flow. But whoever turns away, he will punish him with a painful punishment. Banza and Hatab 2005 concluded that the generic term disability was not mentioned in the Quran. The term disadvantaged people was being used to refer to those with special needs. In fact, society's civil responsibility is illustrated in the Quran which stresses that society is responsible for taking care of such individuals and is responsible for improving their conditions. Disadvantaged situation, lack, lack of some physical, economic, or social character, character, characteristic are believed to be a result of barriers produced by society. Social pressure are put upon those individuals who have special needs to access the social services that are available to them. Individuals have a right to be treated equally. Everyone is uh, equally important, whether disabled or not disabled. Obligation, obligations are placed upon disabled individuals also to seek out the the proper resources for education and not to underestimate their own ab ability and s social role in the society. Okay, so <clears throat> what the Quran basically says is that the society is responsible to support uh, these people with, with uh, disfigurement. Yes, uh, society is responsible and uh, uh, stigmatism is strictly it's, it's not allowed. Uh, you're not yeah, allowed yes. yeah. You wanted to add something, um, Sean? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. I 
I think um, Habib reminded me of uh, the fact that uh, the, when you talk to the priests, they will always say that you, know, you should be kind to others who are disadvantaged or below you. You should always be helpful to them. But uh, what happens in the practice is, I think, a little different. I will start from the, the religion itself. For example, Nepal, constitutionally, is a secular country. Yes, it is a secular mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, people are divided into different beliefs. I don't think you can erase that mm -hmm. belief mm -hmm. from people. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think you got the message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, can I say? Yeah. Um, I think that's absolutely fascinating and it has led me to think uh, how Britain, which is at least initially a Christian country and it has Christian uh, values in its constitution, uh, has taken a, a particular um, position on, on people with disabilities and disfigurements. Um, I guess there are three elements of that. One is the uh, sense of resurrection that's in the Christian gospel that suggests that these, these ad, adverse effects, these bad moments, uh, can be lived through and a better, um, a better life can come as afterwards. Um, the second is that uh, there is an expectation that the community as a whole prays and supports and there are many instances of miracles and, and so on, and we think of Lord and other places where people are taken for cures. Um, but I think in Britain what's happened is that many of these principles have been enshrined in the welfare state, um, which has really developed very strongly as, mm -hmm. as a way in which uh, the society as a whole can support and empower mm -hmm. um, inadequately in my opinion it hasn't been strong enough it hasn't been big enough but that is what a, a lot of the underpinning of the welfare state mm. i could go on and on and on but i can see you yeah. looking at your yeah. watch and yeah. thinking yeah. that as, a, as the chairman of the panel you've completely yeah. thank you <laughs> so happy if the participants of the panel really are aware of the watch so this is <laughs> very rare um, uh, indeed, we are running out of time, but I think I would just, ra uh, before opening up the discussion, I would just ask you one last question and just uh, ask you to give a short statement. So we, have, we, we were talking about all the problems, all the problems in all our societies, and so the, the question is, how can we, what can we do? How can we help from an international perspective? So we just want your own statement on your background, what should we do? How can we help um, to face this stigmatization? I, I think um, we have to work on the um, young children who are in school to change their um, um, thinking, to change their attitude towards uh, people with uh, uh, deformities. Um, it would be very difficult to change the thinking of the adults um, it takes more effort, I would say. I, I, I would not say it is impossible, but it would take much more effort. Um, rather than that, if we work on the children, I think one day um, the world would be very different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. James, your short statement? Uh, yes, yeah, short. I, <laughs> I'm, I'm certainly sure that the, there is a long time involved in changing these stigmas and their impacts. I'm a great believer in working together, and I think that many of the movements that we've seen that are successful in changing public attitudes um, have been brought about by lots of people getting together. I think mm -hmm. of civil rights particularly, but gay rights and gender rights and transgender rights and I, I hold a great deal of hope because I think in the era of social media we can build up quite a large movement to get much more attention paid to 
facial inequality and disadvantage and, and to press for face equality. So I, I'm not sure I'm optimistic, but I'm confident that okay. if we work together um, across all our societies, we can see change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Happy? Yes, I agree with uh, Mr. James. But um, what I will say more, it is the, um, about like we are doing in our society, like families and uh, tribal, we have the tribal life, so we are doing the, uh, following these rules. It is giving special attention to this disabled people in the community meetings, in the society, in the schools, or in other areas, if there mm -hmm. is one meeting or uh, one exhibition. It will have a good result, I think, because uh, when there is not always a disabled patient or disfigurement, mm -hmm. having disfigurement, mm -hmm. one child, that uh, so someone will, in family or in school will teach to the children that you have not to uh, stare the child with disfigurement. Mm -hmm. So if there will be other meetings in school, exhibitions or in a community meeting, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. give a special attention to these children mm -hmm. and ask them and uh, we teach to the children. It's about education. That, yes, yeah. education yeah. and mm -hmm. teach to the children. This thing can happen with mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. in the cho not choice of this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he has the same rights. Mm -hmm. that, uh, I think it will work. Thank you. Okay, so now I would like to open the discussion and uh, ask for your comments, for questions. If you're not feeling at ease in, in uh, asking the question in English, I will do my best to translate it. Um, so please, uh, comment, ask, whatever you want. We really expected the audience to, to be active, so. Thank you very much Thank for you. a nice discussion. I just was curious more about your charity um, um, part, like what would you say was the biggest change which your charity managed to to do? Was it something in the law? Was it something to increase the quote? What, what was it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Simple question. Um, <laughs> probably the, one of the things, there are two things I'll mention. One is that we managed to achieve legal protection so that uh, discrimination against somebody who has a disfigurement is outlawed in Britain under the Equality Act. That was a very important way in which we drew attention to this problem, of, um, particularly employers who could not discriminate in work, in interviews and so on. That's a very important uh, development, I think. Um, but most, probably most important, we started this familiarization that Habib has mentioned, you've mentioned. So we're starting to get into schools, we're putting posters up in, in uh, public places, on public transport, we're getting people with facial disfigurements appearing in all sorts of different ways in the media, and that is about the culture becoming familiar and not stigmatized. And it'll take a long time, but I think we've, in Britain, we started that, and you know there are now people with, with disfigurements appearing regularly on TV. Well, what? Yes, it happens, it can happen, but it's taken a long time. And I think you can tell that uh, James even read the news for a week in BBC or something, so he was a pioneer in this. Huh? Yeah, yeah, very impressive. Other comments or questions? Yes, back there. Hello. Hi. Um, I want to share a little bit of my experience, actually, with my mom. Uh, she got an accident when she was six months old um, in Colombia, South America. Um, and it was a little bit difficult for her to grow up in a country where people was studying at her and always asking questions. But I think that have changed over the years. Now people look at her, at least they don't go immediately to try to start a conversation just to ask, what happened to you? So I think that is an evolution in about this, like how people see people with any kind of disability or any kind of uh, face issue or whatever. 
But I have a question. She still have hope. You know, she still think, okay, there is so much advancing technology. Maybe something is going to change. Maybe at some point in life, I'm going to be able to see, look different. It is actually possible for somebody. She's uh, 54 years old. So she never had a surgery because she grew up in a really humble family. So she actually wasn't, for her, was impossible to get any kind of plastic surgery. But she, have, she has this hope, you know, like, mm -hmm. what is the advance? You know, what, what can happen in the future? And what's your question exactly? What can happen? The question is, there is any hope for these kind of people who are already old or adult? Not with regard no, to sorry. surgery, <laughs> with regard to plastic surgery. Yes, so that's a question for our doctors. Yes. Uh, uh, definitely. Um, I'm sure there could be something uh, that plastic surgery could offer, uh, depending upon the, the problem. Um, but uh, this afternoon when I was listening to James, uh, there was a very profound um, message I got uh, from him. Of course, there were many profounding things, but one thing as a surgeon, as a plastic surgeon, I got was, you know, how many surgeries do you want to perform on your patients? There is no end to it. You know, there is always something you can do. But he decided, okay, enough. I mean, he had undergone, I'm sure, many operations, but at the end he says, he said, no more operations. I got to do what I need to do. And I need to do um, not just about myself, but uh, uh, about people who have similar kind of problems. And he did not limit his efforts in his own country only. Now he's, he has been international. He's going to um, many different countries across the, the border. I, I think what I'm trying to tell you is I'm sure there must be something that plastic surgeons uh, can do. Um, but again, um, um, the expectation of the patients and the families it's very difficult to match with the available technology or skills or the development of the, the science um, at present. Um, but one day, I'm sure we'll do something. Um, you know, we have like stem cell technology that is coming up. And there are many other techniques uh, that are going to be useful. But again, the the, the, the decision that James made long time ago, after which he started helping others, is very important to note, I think. And I just want to invite you to the next panel, because this is exactly the topic we will discuss in a week. It's about, you know, what shall plastic surgery do? What are the limits and the ethical questions around these things? And so we'll discuss that extensively next week. So I hope you come again and attend that panel too. I think um, you wanted to say something yes. too. Yeah. Yes, we can do something with the surgeries. We can, change, we can bring up changes in the face and other parts of the bodies. But at the same time, and we can give hopes to the patients that you will be better and of course the patient is going better day by day but at the same time we need the um, uh, help of rehabilitation and, uh, and also the psychologist even after five years ten years um, uh, the patient will be will have not a good result or if he or she wanted the result at the same time the psychologist will work on him or her and at, of course, there will be something, um, changes in his mentality. If you will not bring the changing in face, but in mentality can change. And we can give hopes like mm -hmm. this to mm -hmm. the patient. Yeah, in my, in my humble opinion, your mother uh, has probably got to come to terms of the fact that there isn't going to be that magic fix for her. Uh, but it sounds to me as if she's living pretty well now and may find that actually she doesn't really need that surgery. <laughs> she, 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 she might prefer to have a little holiday or, yeah. Or Instead of staying in the hospital, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question back there. 
Well, it is really nerve-wracking for me as it hits home really close to me because I'm a burn victim as well, and I have vitiligo. I don't know if you know this, but this is a skin condition that affects my melanin cells. I'm basically, because of an autoimmune disease, I'm losing them. So I'm going to turn like white, <laughs> and I'm going to lose my skin color. So my question, as I've had this ever since I'm eight years old, um, what can we do as a society to improve the situation? Because still, even though I grew up here, I lived my whole life here, I still get stares um, on the street, and it's really, really uncomfortable because I feel like, what's wrong with me? Like, there's, is there anything wrong with me? Like, what can we do as a society that, or anybody here can do um, if they see somebody like me or somebody who has a disfigurement, what can we do to improve the situation? Uh, can I take that? Yeah, of course. Um, well, um, you probably come across Winnie Harlow. Uh, does anybody else know who Winnie Harlow is? Hands up if you know who Winnie Harlow wow. is. Okay, so Winnie Harlow is a fantastically successful model who has vitiligo and is making the news. She is a celebrity, a top-ranked celebrity. Um, I would say that she is giving the most amazing role model, uh, and maybe we need to do some articles about her in Switzerland, and uh, maybe there are some media people here in the room who'd like to, to do that, because it is about, as we've been saying, it is about familiarizing your culture with these issues. And, and in Britain, we've had a huge challenge with vitiligo, and not enough people have put up their hands and said, I've got vitiligo, partly because they can cover it up with camouflage creams mm -hmm. very cleverly, and nobody notices. Um, I think that, that it is a very big issue to have vitiligo and burns, so I'm, I'm admiring that you stand up and ask a question, and good for you. And I think these, the fact that we're gathered here today and you have a, um, a, an association, hot stigma, hot stigma. Hot stigma yeah, yeah. starting to build up. The, the important thing is you're starting. And these things take time, but you know, more power to you. And I'd happy to speak to you afterwards. Thank you. I think also this exhibition is exactly um, something we're doing because of we want to make the society familiar with all these um, conditions. And because research clearly shows, as you said, as soon as something is familiar, uh, you don't have these negative um, appraisals anymore. Not necessarily as soon. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's gradually, you're right. I'm too optimistic. Okay. <laughs> but but the familiarity is, is, is so important and, and I think that's also one of the main aims of, of this exhibition uh, and this panel and all these uh, activities. Yeah. Okay. Um, other questions or comments or yes please. Hello. Um, Hi. I was wondering if you can tell me about strategies that people use. Um, I agree, I think it's important that society changes or their view, um, but it will probably take a while, and what can people do in the meantime to yes. you know, have their own strategies yes. and deal with it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a question for James. They have so nice acronyms with changing faces. You can just uh, tell them about Briefly. that. <laughs> Briefly. And I'm, sorry, briefly, and I'm very happy to speak to you afterwards. Um, and please do go and visit the Changing Faces website um, because there is a lot of self-help advice there. Um, we advise people uh, in developing strategies not to have one strategy for dealing with staring or questions or comments or ridicule, uh, to have a range of strategies that they can use depending on the circumstance. So if they are asked, core, what happened to you in a supermarket queue, they have the chance to give the one line sentence. Um, but if it happens in a party and you want to explain, then you need to have a longer um, explanation. Um, probably the most important thing that we've developed is assertiveness. I think 
most of the people that contact us feel very vulnerable to intrusive remarks, invasive looks, and so on. And we teach assertiveness, the ability to not be aggressive, but not to be passive either, but to be assertive. Um, please don't look at me like that. It's a simple sentence said with quite a lot of power can be enormously empowering for the person to learn. So they just, you know, they learn some simple sentences and that gives them a kind of armor. Um, no, my name isn't Scarface, it's James. You know, not said, no, my name isn't Scarface, it's James, <laughs> but actually said firmly, um, but not aggressively, I, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> So these things are coping strategies that people can learn and, and that's not to say they're quick. And parents have a major role in playing, in helping the child as they grow. And this is why it's so good to see psychologists as part of multidisciplinary teams because they can empower the, ch the family to teach some of these skills so that they become absolutely natural for the child as they grow up. That's probably enough, don't you think? Yeah, I think, but you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a huge topic, and I, I think what you said there, uh, it's really worth to visit the, the website. You have so wonderful material up there, you can download most of the materials, and, and it's really helpful, and, and you, you have a, uh, a lot of acronyms which are very helpful, just to, you know, like to, to memorize, uh, like FACES and uh, other acronyms, and Would so... You? Reach Ciao. out is another one. Um, so yeah. do please. I'm happy to talk to you after. Okay. Thank you for these questions. Are there? Yeah, there's one more. I, had, I have a question. I'm not sure if you understood her question correctly. <laughs> I was expecting um, possibilities or strategies for the so-called normal not to stare on the street. Don't oh. you think that's interesting too? Oh, I think it's very, very interesting. <laughs> Do you develop that too? Yes, there are a whole lot of messages on the website about that too. Although they're actually very, very simple. They're not, they're not rocket science. Okay, so, so tell them. Um, so I don't know if there's, oh, there, is, there is somebody who's a bit bald on my right here. I'm sorry, so I'm going to just sort of... When you meet somebody who's a little bit bald, what do you do? Do you spend your entire time looking at his bald head? No. There's another man on my left here who is going a bit gray. Do you, do, do you look at him and make all sorts of assumptions about him going gray? Probably not. You don't even stare. Now, it would be great in a world of face equality, whereby if somebody meets me or meets somebody who has a facial disfigurement, I'm treated just like a man who has a bald head or a woman who has graying hair. It's no different. I just happen to have some marks on my, on my face. That's, that would be 50-50, face equality. We're not there yet. But the most important message is treat people as you would other people. So don't, don't sort of think you've got to invent some new behavior. Gosh, I'm, I've got to treat this. Oh, God, I must get, get my sympathy out. Or No, 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 no. <laughs> Just look them in the eye and say hello. And they're perf probably perfectly normal and very good conversation and all of those sort of normal things. But of course, we're all spooked because this figure, my God, it must be awful and ah, I'm embarrassed and I, I don't know what to say. Well, just try saying hello, if you can, or it's a little smile and a little wave. And actually, I'm not going to. The man on my right is, on my left is saying, don't treat me like that. <laughs> you know, I'm just a man with some gray hair, that's all. I don't need to be patronized or anything. I'm sorry I'm being a bit flippant because it's the end of the evening, but um, I don't think it's rocket science. Okay, okay so... Oh, Habib yes. wants to say something. <laughs> so, yeah, 
<laughs> she was talking about I have one friend, he's a doctor now, but uh, he has vitiligo. Uh, and uh, when he's calling me or any other person, so you will say, which one you are? He will say, I'm red and white. <laughs> <laughs> Himself, he never mind it if someone will call him like this. So he has very simple life, normal life. Yeah. And the other, <clears throat> I think for this, the family support is important for such a people or tribal support. Like in our country, we have the family system, giant family system, or one tribe in rural area, they are living all together. So no one can say something to the child or to the adult. Uh, they cannot stare him. Uh, the family has suppo is supporting her. The tribe is supporting her. So like this, if in the community, there, is a, there will be a support of the government. If someone with a scar will complain mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. someone, mm -hmm. he will receive punishment. So like this, it can mm -hmm. also can okay. stop. OK. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Um, um, considering the time, we're a bit <laughs> late, um, and because we also have an opera afterwards, so we can uh, continue with discussions maybe just in smaller groups afterwards, and we are all there, and you are also outside afterwards, so we can follow up with some of the discussions. I, w I would like to thank you very much. It was very, very interesting to discuss with you. Uh, I would also like to thank you. I think it's uh, you were uh, really active at the end, and so we had some really additional, very interesting questions here. And I hope and I really believe we have learned something today. We have also seen that this is not a simple, there is not a simple solution to all these problems. This is a huge problem. It not only affects um, disfigured people, it also affects other uh, individuals with other types of stigmas, like um, mental health problems, like um, disabled children, and so on. So it's really a huge topic, and we were just speaking about a, a part of this really huge problem. And still, I think there is some reason for uh, careful or uh, optimism, maybe, um, James? Uh, Cautious, uh, cautious, cautious optimism. And uh, just with this, I would like to end uh, the panel. Thank you for coming. And hopefully we'll see most of you again in a week um, for the next panel. Thank you very much.